Okay, so Evan, uh, many of you know, uh, is director of Emerge Guelph uh, Sustainability, and uh, where he works tirelessly to uh, try to educate people on energy and water conservation. Uh, sustainability is basically in this guy's DNA, all right? He, uh, he has a rare blend of skills uh, that make him effective. So he's an environmental policy wonk. He, uh, he has deep technical knowledge in uh, energy, particularly uh, solar and wind, from windmills in Tanzania to that uh, super large uh, wind, uh, wind tower or wind uh, uh, generator in uh, Toronto that you see when you go in on the QEW. So uh, Evan managed that uh, operation for a number of years. He's passionate about the environment, uh, advocating on wilderness uh, protection, waste management, and conservation, renewable generation, you name it, he's been doing it. Um, this guy, not only that, but the, he also walks the talk. And sometimes he bikes, the, he bikes uh, or, or sometimes canoes. Um, he, uh, for instance, uh, what was it? Going from the Great Lakes to the Arctic? Something crazy like that? Um, so I've known Evan since I moved to Guelph uh, about eight years ago. We met through Transition Guelph. We worked together on solar projects. Um, uh, I met you through Greco, so the, uh, the Guelph Renewable Energy Co-op, and, um, and more recently through our uh, uh, guest geeking out on, on electric vehicles, right? So, in fact, my, my entire family has benefited from Evan, okay? so. Absolutely, yeah. You know, he's taught my wife bicycle safety, um, literally on the roads. He, uh, he has also given my children an appreciation of the environment through photography uh, via your work with Focus on Nature. And as for me, um, and you don't know this, but it's true, what you have done for me is that you've given me, um, uh, you've taught me how to deal with, you know, difficult, heady, sustainability issues, uh, and, and communicate effectively around that, you know, without scaring people, uh, without, uh, you know, alienating them, intimidating them, or pissing them off. So, in fact, I'm still learning that last one, but... So, anyway, I'll stop there, and um, I'll let you come up and uh, talk. Evan, thank you. I'm going to have to lower your expectations of what to expect tonight after that. <laughs> um, we're going to use a magic clicker today, and it's just going to go like that. Oh, wow, that, that happened, ra happened, ra happened rather quickly. But I, I do want to recognize my colleague, Rasha, who's there with her camera right there, who's, who's also with, uh, with Emerge. She's our sustainability coordinator, and it's been a, been a joy working with Rasha. If you've got any more questions about Emerge at the break, by all means, chat with uh, chat with Rasha as well. Um, this came together very, in a very few short weeks uh, when, uh, I can't even see, there's Wilfred right there. When Wilfred uh, and I connected and he said, oh, someone dropped off uh, the, uh, <laughs> from a speaker's pr perspective, how can we do something that will, that will uh, um, uh, uh, motivate people or, or be provocative? So we will be provocative tonight. And based on some of the emails and messages that I've got from a few people, I suspect that we are gonna be provocative tonight. Um, but first, I just want to give you a brief, really brief piece, and Rob threatened to, to, to scream, I think, if I gave the same talk about 100% renewable. But, I, but I'd be remiss with Emerge if I didn't talk about what we do, and essentially, we fight climate change. Here's a quick advertisement for a couple of events we have coming up. The first thing is... Getting up in the morning and trying to fight climate change can be really, 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 did I say really, really depressing. So once a year we have something called comedy and climate change that we do with our friends at, uh, at the Making Box. And what, this is the third year that we have a climate change heroes. And in this case, it's two women, two 17-year-old women who have been absolutely profound in their ability to motivate high school students across the city. And that's, uh, that's Indigo Kim and Saffron Binder who will be our... Uh, uh, our honorees uh, uh, this year. And please join us. It's a lot of fun. We can laugh about climate change, and I think it's therapeutic for all of us. And the other thing that's coming up is on March 26th is the annual, it's our Lucky 13 uh, eco market that I think many of you have probably been at before. We generally have about 3,000 people that come out to this event, and it's an env environmental sustainability uh, event that I think you'd all appreciate it. 
Um, so quickly, I just want to talk about that, that we find that, that what we're about to talk about today integrates well with our concept of where we, need, where we believe, Emerge believes that the energy transition needs to get to, and that's ultimately to get to 100% renewable energy. Um, and what that looks like, or rather what it doesn't look like, and I want you to keep two things in mind when we talk about 100% renewable energy, because a lot of people have a sense of what, of what that looks like. And uh, I want to emblazon this, this image in your brain. This isn't what it's about. It's not about sticking solar panels and wind turbines on an SUV and think that we've done the job. And the reason that this isn't it is because of this. At best, at best, we waste two thirds of all of the energy that we use in this country, at absolute best. So imagine how much better or how much easier it could be to get to that 100% renewable if indeed we tackled this first. And I know a lot of people in this room work on this and I know a lot of the design work that, uh, that Charles has been involved with and that Rob has been involved with uh, essentially go, go after attacking that, that two thirds. Um, this is quick. I'm going to read through it really quickly, but this is how we get to 100% renewable. That conservation and efficiency piece has to be first. We need a local uh, electrical distribution system. We need to seize te uh, technical opportunities when they present themselves. We need to look at full cost accounting, read carbon pricing or whatever else you might want to call it there. Um, we need to electrify the energy system and what that piece means is about electrifying the transportation, the greater transportation system and electrifying the heating system which in some people's minds it doesn't quite make sense, but happy to chat with you about it. And then as we're doing that, and it should be hierarchical, that job, that massive switch to renewables at the end of it becomes really quite a heck of a lot simpler. And here's essentially what I want to chat about today. From the time that I saw that building up, build, being built, and I've got to tell you what a geek I've been, that I was actually out there when they were digging the hole and I was taking pictures of it because I wanted to record this. My goal is that within 30 years, we're gonna watch that being torn down, along with other parkades in Guelph. Downtown, my guess is that we're close to at least 2,000 off-street parking places. This is just under 500. The two parkades that are at the, um, at Old Quebec Street Mall is approximately 900. Then, of course, we have a couple of the smaller, the, the smaller par uh, on uh, 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 surface mount uh, uh, parking spaces at Baker Street and then between McDonnell and Cork Street. I hate the fact that the city spent $30 million on that. Imagine instead if we sat around here and figured out, sorry James, it's all your fault, obviously. You're the only person from city council here. So, so yell at James afterwards. Yeah, yeah please, please do. Yeah. <laughs> oh Marty, you're so predictable. Uh, um, imagine instead if we were here trying to decide the best way that we could have spent that $30 million to get the best bang for our buck from a transportation network. So don't get me started on that one, but let's try to keep moving. You didn't know there was a test, and I didn't tell Wilfred there was a test. So here's the test. Series of cities, and I'm gonna read them off quickly, and then the second time around, you've got two choices. And what I want you to decide is which two places, whether you've been there before, just from a gut feeling, I'm not giving you many, much more criteria than that, I want you to put up your hand twice, for the, for, so two different cities that you would like to ride your bike in. So, so I'll read them off, and so you've got, you've got two votes, and, and as I read it off, um, just put up your hand. We'll get through this. So the first one is Amsterdam. Brampton. Copenhagen. Guelph. Manhattan. Phoenix. Toronto. Vancouver. And Victoria. I've, I've done this for the last 20 years with high school students, with grade 10 students, and it never ceases to amaze me. Now, I realize that you're a bunch of, you know, a, 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 um, sustainability type geeks, my word for you. It may not fit for all of you, so it doesn't surprise me where those decisions were, but what I saw here was no different from, uh, from a really wide group of grade 10 students over the last, actually, I say 20, I think it's 25 years now, that essentially, your choices lined up with the highest density of cities that you can see there. And, and, and what it tells about humanity is that we, t we tend to like to be together, that generally we're very social beings. And from a planning perspective, we've seemed to have done just the opposite of, of that. 
Instead, we've seemed to have decided that our, we should be working towards lower density. I mean, look at Guelph at 1,300, Brampton's at 60. Even Brampton's better than Guelph. That number surprised me. But I suspect that the fact's a fact because we had so much more greenfield uh, opportunities still available in Guelph. Um, but even people were suggesting, you know, some people had their hands up for Manhattan. And I understand that Manhattan has been extremely aggressive from a bicycle riding perspective. And all of that, all of that is about, is, is about what social beings that we, that we actually are. Some of you may have seen, seen where we're, where we're going to end on this in the past, but I've used this also with, with high school students, and we were kind of surprised to see people's reaction to it. So two cities. One is Guelph, and the other is a place called, if there are any Dutch speakers in it, the Groningen. Oh, how's that? Hey, hey, yeah. I, English speakers would call it Groningen, but Groningen. Um, so let's, let's take a look at these two. So population, yeah, Koningen is significantly higher at 195,000 compared to 120 some odd in Guelph. Square area, not far off. We're slightly bigger than Groningen, but clearly they have a higher density than we would because of the area and the population relative to ours. University population, I purposely put this up because in both cases, it's quite significant percentage of the population and that changes the flavor of, of, of our community at least, for six months, at least for six months of the year. Here's the thing, bike parking at the train station. Well, let's look at Guelph. Oh, there's my wife, Chung Ying. Oh, <laughs> fancy meeting her here. So what have we got at, 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 the, at, the, at the station in Guelph? We've got 20 bike parking spaces on the Cardin Street side. So the side that's closest to us. And on the other side, oh, the only bike, that happens to be my bike, the only bike being used there. That's at Fountain Street. So that's 16 bikes there. If we add it together, that's actually pretty good. We got 36 bicycle parking spaces there. Pretty exciting. Well, let's take a look at Honingen. So if we've got 36, I'll let that one sink in for a second. Let's go to the next one. They also have multi-level bike parking. Now, granted, granted, densities in Holland are significant, so, so countrywide densities in Holland are significantly greater, and Groningen, you know, they are a slightly larger city, population-wise. The distance between Groningen and Amsterdam is about the same distance as Guelph is from Toronto. So we're talking similar distances, and, and you know that the number of commuters from Guelph to places towards Mississauga and Toronto is significantly greater than the four GO trains that go in every day. Significantly greater than that. So let's look at that. It's 10,000. 10, a lot of people talk about Rotterdam having 12,000. Yes, Rotterdam has 12,000, but this is a, the, the, Rotterdam's at least five to six times the size of population that Honingen is. So you start understanding that, okay, what's going on here? And clearly they've got a higher density than us. Clearly there's all sorts of planning related things to it, but let's keep moving. Trips by bike in Guelph, this number might be out of date, 2.3%, 50% in Honingen. In the downtown core, it's 60%. So imagine that, 60% in the downtown core of that community. And one more, whoops, and one more. Um, this, you don't need to go to planning school or transportation school. This one slide sells it all from a priority standpoint. If we built cities with this in mind from a size perspective, we would probably get a heck of a lot closer to Koningen in a hell of a quicker time where we would put all the emphasis on that pedestrian and then the cyclist and you'll notice that we've got a floating, a floating accessibility logo there that with all of our transport needs, transportation needs, we always have to ensure that there's integration from, a, from an accessibility standpoint. But look at that. We're gonna put something else in that electric bike. So we've added an, uh, 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 an, another EV. Yes, it is considered an electric vehicle because bicycles are considered vehicles under the Highway Traffic Act. And in Europe, there's been an explosion in the use of electric uh, bicycles because what, it, what it's actually doing is it's taking a whole new demographic onto bicycles for, you know, more so than just, uh, than just leisures, leisure rather, but these are people that might not have been on a bike for 20 years. They don't like the hills in Guelph. They may not quite feel that they're in shape enough to do this, and they've got to go long distances that they didn't think that they could deal with in the first place. 
If you've ever tried one of these things, I'm, I'm a bike snob and thought I'd never try one. And I tell you, it wasn't until Cosmo Carreri at, at Speed River, he browbeat me every time I went in there. Because I, I get my bike service and I've had, you know, I bought bikes from them in the past. And I was really, really, really surprised at the ease of use of this thing. And it doesn't do all the work for you. You still have to add some value to it. It's, it's helping with things. So, the, so as we're going down that hierarchy, you'll see public transportation is electrified. And then you'll see personal transportation is electrified. And ICE, I'm going to use this term, ICE, in case you haven't heard of it, it stands for Internal Combustion Engine Vehicles. We could say gas cars, but there are also diesel vehicles out there. So it's the electrification of all of the transportation system. Um, and what's happened is that how we wound up built up, being built up, unlike Honingen, is that we've put a disproportionate amount of land that's being used for personal vehicles, period. Either from a road perspective, from a parking perspective, even at our homes, the amount of land that we have to use to store these idiotic things is, is, is absolutely absurd. Here's an interesting, an, an interesting piece, is that vehicle utilization. So what that means is the amount of time that the average person that owns a vehicle is using that car is 4% of the time. So that means that we're storing that thing for 96% of the time. And think about the resources. Think about what you'd do with that $30 million with that most recent car park if indeed we didn't, we, we didn't build that idiotic thing. Imagine it could have been affordable housing with commercial and, and, uh, uh, and retail in that building. There could have been so many exciting things that we could have done with it. And that 4% utilization has a profound impact, a massive impact on land use, obviously. The environment, clearly, because we have, we're, we're driving very long distances, we're paving land, we have a, a, um, um, a ridiculous percentage of hard surfaces that add to runoff and add to salt in, in the ecosystem. From a health perspective, we're moving less, there's less physical activity, and at the same time, obviously, the pollution that goes into the air. And from an economic standpoint, they're not that economical. And I'll show you why as we're, coming, as we're, as we're moving ahead. And from the perspective of where we're going, this figure, we, we did, we're, 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 as many of you know, we've been pushing electric vehicles. And, and we can have a separate concert conversation about that. We're going to get to a point where we're talking about um, 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 autonomous vehicles, but this number blew us away when, when, uh, when we pulled it. Um, in 2018, there were 8,100 new vehicles sold in Guelph, and that's a combination of passenger vehicles and, and, uh, and light trucks. The year before was 8,400, so we were surprised that there was, a, there was a drop. And we did an analysis. We actually had some really robust data that, uh, that uh, is based on the new car registrations that actually happen in Guelph, not the cars that are sold. Um, and, and this one really gave me heartburn. Um, so you'll see 2017 over 2018, uh, so, sorry, 2018 over 2017, technically, I guess. But look at that. Two thirds of it, fully two thirds of both of them were light trucks. So let me ask you this question. Why would someone knowingly pay three times the amount for gas than you would with your hybrid? Uh, I mean, Susan, Susan, Susan uh, gets about five liters per 100 kilometers. An SUV, probably closer to 15, uh, 15, 15 liters per kilometer. And yet people constantly complain about gas, that, it, that it's too full. But there's, there's definitely, a, definitely, a, a, definitely a disconnect between them two. And it, it may be just an error in the figures, but, but technically there was a slight increase um, in the number of, uh, of, of, of trucks uh, up to 67% from 66. It could, be, you know, it could be a rounding error, I'm not sure. Uh, regardless, that two thirds really, really, really gives me heartburn. Go to any mall parking lot and look. You, know, you don't have to be a statistician to figure it out. It's kind of frightening when you see the size of the vehicles. And, um, and, and this, this part, part of that study that we were doing, we were trying to evaluate whether Guelph, whether we were having any impact on that market penetration of those vehicles. So in 2018, the province of Ontario saw a 109% increase in EV sales, 
while the national average was at about 125. And you might say, well, why was Ontario is usually close to the Canadian average, or it becomes the Canadian average by default. Ontario was lower because that was the year that the provincial government pulled the, pulled the plug on the rebates. So there was only a partial year of it. And yet, um, we were able to attain 171% year-over-year increase between those, between those years. So we're pretty happy about that. I'd like to think that we had an impact on that. But um, uh, when you're starting to deal with adoption rates that are talking about 100% increase in year-over-year -year sales, you're talking about logarithmic growth. And you start doing the math on this stuff, and it's pretty scary to predict any, any, kind, of, uh, uh, any, any kind of understanding of where this is going and do it with a good level of accuracy, under the, under, other than realizing that it's definitely going up. As you can see, that's a significant difference between Ontario and, uh, and Guelph. So that 4% utilization, can EVs help? Well, from a land use perspective, no. Because if all that we do is just turn around and buy an electric car, we're still dealing with that, um, um, with, with, with that, um, um, with that land use issue. We haven't dealt with, assuming that we're still gonna have the same number of cars. So if you do the math on the, um, on the 8,000 cars per year, I think it's a turnover of the entire fleet. Don't quote me on this. When I did the math, I think it was every eight, eight or nine years. So it, it's close to the, t it's close to the average lifespan of an ICE car, of an ICE car. EVs, on the other hand, are expected to last twice the distance fr uh, fr from a mileage perspective or from a kilometer perspective. So that, that, that in and of itself is, is going to have an impact. From my perspective, you know, so you might say, well, why the heck is Emerge pushing EVs? It's a bridge. In my mind, I see it as a bridge. And by accelerating that kind of stuff, we can help accelerate that technology. I don't like putting all my eggs in, the, in one basket. Uh, I'd, I'd rather everybody just walked and biked, for God's sakes, or take public transit. And we have to, we have to be vigilant on that. But what we keep doing with Emerge is we keep going back to that 8,000 and saying, OK, if those 8,000 people have decided to buy a new car, and by the way, last year, the average price for a new car was $34,000. Um, so there is a lot of disposable income out there. How many of them can we move? How many of them can we get them to change that decision? Oops, sorry, can you back up one more? Back up again? Um, but where it does see improvement, and it's, it's not ideal, there's no question. I mean, and, and, and there are downsides to it, but there's definitely an improvement from an environment, from a an health, and from an economy standpoint. I won't go into a lot of details with this, but I will show you this next one. And this is, uh, this is cradle to grave analysis that's, uh, that's been done, and I've seen it done in different, in different circumstances. So, so let, me, let me explain it. On the far left is conventional ICE vehicles. The, 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 the furthest column is an average European car. The gray area is the, t, uh, sorry, the tailpipe emissions from CO2. The orange is the fuel cycle. What did it take to deliver that fuel to that car in the first place? So the tailpipe is what actually comes out of it. The, the fuel cycle is how did it, how, what did it take to get it to, get it to that car? And uh, then the, the other manufacturing, the manufacturing of the vehicle, those were the CO2 emissions. So the far left is an average Euro car. The one to the right of it is a Prius. So you can see significantly lower on the fuel cycle side of it because it uses less fuel, and also because it uses less fuel, significantly less on the tailpipe. So across the other ones, you can see the EU average. I want to, I want to point out, so in all the other cases, it's using a Nissan Leaf. Rob's got a Nissan Leaf. You should ask him about it. But it's, it's, it's been on the market um, the longest of, I, I guess it's, it's had the largest market share before Tesla jumped ahead of things. And they've jumped ahead with a much more expensive car. So, so the Nissan Leaf is a good comparison. It's, it's a good nuts and bolts car as opposed to something that's you know, glitzy and glamorous. And what it compares it to is that you'll notice some of those things when you, it's exactly the same car. The dark blue at the bottom is about the manufacturing component of it. The brown section is the fuel cycle. The fuel is electricity in this. So what they're accounting for is what the electricity mix looks like in those individual countries. And based on the height of those, you can tell that Germany is the most carbon intensive because the brown area is the largest. By the same token, Norway is approaching 99% uh, renewable energy. So you can see where they are. And the next best after Norway is France. And France, that's because 80% of their electrical grid they're even more, more nuclearized than Ontario. 
On Ontario uh, hovers, between, uh, hovers around 55%. France is about 80. I have drawn the red line. That's my relatively uninformed but best guess at where we would land in Ontario. Because you've got to look at this from a jurisdictional perspective. Regardless, even in Germany, and I've seen similar things, and I couldn't find it for this presentation, but I've seen similar analyses of places like Alberta, where clearly you're not going to see the same amount of reduction because it's so carbonized. On the, uh, um, you're still seeing a reduction, albeit not as profound as any of these, and maybe not even as good as, as, as Germany, but it would be better than the average Euro car on the other side of that. So that 4% four, um, 4 utilization, yeah, okay. So on the environmental side, of it, I mean, there are other unintended consequences. You know, there's, there's the issue of the batteries and, and you know, are there issues around uh, some of the minerals that are being used and, and is there slave labor? Is there child labor being used on it? And um, the analysis and the stuff, the, the, the research that we've done shows that all the battery manufacturers, you know, they're not idiots. They know this stuff is going on and they know they're being criticized for it. And they're all racing to reduce the amounts of those types of minerals from, from those batteries. And the last report I saw showed Tesla was at about a third the amount of, uh, of uh, materials uh, that were problematic compared to the others. And their intention was to continue to drive it down. Again, not putting all my eggs in the technology basket, but you got to know that the, the bleeding edge technology in the lab is all about driving those things into the ground. And I'm sorry, bad analogy, but, but trying to reduce the use of those types of things, increase the performance, and also increase something called energy density. And what energy density is that for every kilowatt, uh, sorry, every kilo or every pound of battery, how much energy can we jam into it? And if we can get more energy into that same pound or kilo of, uh, of battery, that means the car will go longer. And we have to use less materials. So we know that, we know that from, from a competition standpoint, here's one thing, here's, here's an opportunity that competition really makes a difference. And plus pointing out the fact that some of these, are, some of these materials are problematic are helping to change that landscape at the, same, at the same time. So here we are from a household perspective and these are, uh, these are Guelph, uh, the, um, uh, the average ICE vehicle is about 4.2 tons a year in a household. So uh, I, I know that on average a household is upwards of 15 to, uh, to 20 tons a year. So we're approaching somewhere just shy of, of 10 tons between these two. These are, the, these are the areas that most people think of. The top one is all the energy that we're using in a home. So it's heating, ventilation, hot water heating, uh, and all of your appliances amounts to about four and a half tons uh, per year. An ICE vehicle is 4.2. And I'll tell you the piece about this slide that gives me the most amount of heartburn. M my, my heart is with um, uh, energy efficiency and going after that heating, ventilations, and appliances and, and drastically reducing that amount. The unfortunate part about that, as, as many of the designers in this building and engineers in this building that work in that field and architects, it's extremely difficult to take four tons out of a home. There are mo this is of an existing home. And remember that, that, that you know, the overwhelming majority of homes we're talking about are existing. The new stuff needs to be best, best of class. It's extremely difficult to get four tons out of it. If we move one of those 8,000 decisions towards that, it's four tons. Four tons per vehicle in that home. So it's, it's quite profound. Is that based on like 25,000 uh, kilometers? It's 20,000 it's 20, 20, kilometers a year is, is the number that's used. And actually, if you're interested, there's a really good chart. Uh, if you're familiar with it, we work very closely with they've, uh, And they're going to be back at the eco market again. Is a not-for-profit from Toronto called Plug and Drive. And uh, they, their mandate is just to promote EVs. We'll have um, EV 101 classes and um, test drives. But they have a great comparison by make and manufacture, like the actual model. And it tells you the CO2 emissions by province. So you can run down that. And you'll notice that in, in Ontario, you're, you're cutting over four tons. Whereas in Alberta, you know, you're probably under 0.5. But it's still better. And we also know that even someplace like Alberta or Saskatchewan is getting better. Um, and I'm going back to this purposely because in spite of what I'm talking about, I, we need to remember this piece. We need to continue to push down this path, but we've got some opportunities with this autonomous, autonomous vehicle start, stuff. An opportunity to make lives simpler for people that uh, things take off. 
I'm, I'm just going to read some of the, some of these things. This is what happens, and 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 disruptive technologies are everything from the original um, uh, the re original development of the telephone. I mean, it, it was it, it was uh, it was absolutely groundbreaking at the time. But the adoption rate took almost 60 years before it hit a market penetration of, I believe, economists. I think it's 60 or 70 percent of the population when they consider that it's it's met. You know, like it, it's it's there. Um, Smartphones was the shortest adoption rate of any, uh, of any disruptive technology that we've ever seen. And it was a matter of like a couple of three years. It was, it was next to nothing. Because all those right pieces, I mean, then the internet is, is, is so crucial in that. People had cell phones for a long time. And even the cell phone adoption rate was significantly longer than, than the... Um, um, uh, th than, the, th than the smartphone. So, so what, what are they? They supersede older processes, products, or habits. They usually, uh, sorry, they usually have superior attributes, immediately obvious, I thought this next one was interesting, to the, to, um, 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 at least to early ad adopters. So think of all the EV geeks that might be in this room. I, I mean, that, so there are a lot of people that, that tend to be early adopters, and the early adopters are important because they're willing to pay additional costs to help establish that product and get to a point where the manufacturers can build it out to a scale where the price drops. Um, upstarts, rather than established cost, uh, companies, are the usual source. And of course, I mean, Tesla's the ideal example of that. But who has a Nokia phone today? Uh, I, I, I mean, you know, like whatever happened to them? They had a very different business model that was based on we've always done it this way, we continue to move forward, um, and profoundly impacts society. And here are the three areas that, 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 that disruptive technologies profoundly impact society from an economic perspective. Did any of you as kids ever think that you'd have a phone and you, it's, it'd be like Dick Tracy, you'd have like TV on it, except it's not on your wrist. It's, yeah, not all of you know that. In a, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh, it would be on this hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, and from a social perspective, how many dining rooms or restaurants have you gone into where people are eating and on their phones at the same time? No, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm being, being facetious here. But you do see it. Needless to say, it's had a profound impact socially and environmentally. And, and more often than not, while there are definitely benefits on all three of these, there are usually unintended consequences that are, ne uh, uh, that are negative. And the convergence of technologies, what's, what's, what's key there is that cost dropping to a point where it, it helps move up that adoption curve past that early, past that early adopters. So let's look, at, look, let's look at it from an EV perspective. We saw that huge um, uh, increase. So these are massive numbers, but to put that in a context, out of that 8,100 in 2018, and, and we're waiting for the 2019 numbers right now, in 2018, that amounted to 206 cars in Guelph compared to 8,100. So you start thinking, okay, well, well, yeah, but still, when you're talking over 100% increase in year-over-year -year adoption, that number can, can go very high very quickly. Here's a straight line um, uh, sort of extrapolation of that, uh, not of the Guelph number. The Guelph number was 171%. So all I did was I said, okay, we know in 2018 it was 2.2%. Uh, of all cars sold, so let's use the 109%. Let's be conservative. Let's say only 109% year over year, but look at it. In less than four years from now, conceivable, this is the power of logarithmic growth. It's kind of scary um, that, that you start understanding is, look at the impact that it has. By the same token, people say, well, there aren't that many out there. Well, every single car manufacturer has, has, uh, has committed or announced major changes to their product mix to include plugins, whether they're plug-in hybrids, but most of them are going down the path of, of plugins specifically. So the 4% utilization, remember, we ha has a big impact. So from a land use perspective, uh, oops, uh, so I want you to remember this piece again, 4% utilization, we're storing it for 96% of the time. And those converging technologies, this is what it starts to look like when we're talking about so EVs are one side of it, just, so, so think of the EVs like the Nokia flip phones. And think of autonomous vehicles the same way that we think of a smartphone. Like that's the technological leap that we're talking, but even more so. 
So battery technology has gotten to a point where we can put enough batteries in the car that yes, it's reasonable for people to drive reasonable dif distances. Um, and it's getting better all the time and the cost is going down. So those, those are going together. EVs as a whole are getting to a point where they are extremely reliable. There's a factoid that I want to send out there. The average ICE vehicle has 2,000 moving parts. You don't have to be an engineer to understand it, but in a, an electric vehicle, there are 20. 20. So understand the unintended, the unintended consequences of how many garages do you know? How many 14-year-olds want to become mechanics today? And I'd strongly recommend you point them in a different direction if they're 14-year-olds and they want to become a mechanic. The implication is mind-boggling from, from that perspective. Uh, well, from a parts perspective, there's no question. And companies like Linamar have made a point that they are trying to expand their product range to, to, to help facilitate this. The autonomous vehicle technologies, some people saying, you know, Evan, you're kind of nuts. This is the Jetsons. Oh, there's another one out. There's another cartoon from the past. <laughs> so, so that's the Jetsons. Stop. Well, actually, they're on the road, and they might have even passed you today when obviously you were walking or biking to this event tonight. Someone asked me, someone asked me to ask you how you came here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shame you into, into asking how you, how you got here. Um, Tesla, one of the add-on features that, if, if, so there may be even be te a Tesla owners here, if you can shed a little more light on this, but one of the things that you can buy with Tesla, I mean, as some of you know, they have a certain degree of autonomous technology that's built into it. Then you can buy and upgrade an additional $5,000 for their fully integrated autonomous uh, technology. And you're thinking like, Okay, so where are they going with this? This is where they're going with this. The long-term business plan of Elon Musk isn't to sell you a car, it's to offer you a service. And that service will be an autonomous, electric, hailable car that will be just as, if not more convenient than you pulling your phone out, saying you wanna go to wherever, to the grocery store, walking out the door and the car is there. The convenience, so, 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 but here's the second part of it. You're thinking like, okay, so, but why, is, why does he try to convince you, the buyer, to spend an extra, extra $5,000 on the car? Uh, oh, and I should also add, they designed the car so that they could sell it to you one year, two years, or three years after you've bought it. And here's the reason why. When you're sleeping, or when you're working, and that car isn't being used, they're gonna lease it back from you. And they're gonna put it into autonomous vehicle use. And they're going to make money on your car after you've paid for the upgrade to make it autonomous in the first place. So the technology is already in there. It's a matter of them remotely uh, actually going in and activating it and sending you a bill for $5,000 plus HST. So this isn't Booga Booga Jetsons or Dick Tracy or Popeye or whatever. Like This exists today. The on-demand transport is kind of like an Uber. Or, yeah, go ahead, Eric. It, it, it is very much. And there are unintended consequences. People are concerned of getting hit by autonomous vehicles. How are they going to deal with all sorts of things? But here's the other thing that Tesla's done. So there are a lot of companies, all the major car companies have been putting a lot of money into developing pilots of autonomous vehicles. And, you know, they have to get permission and all this stuff. And they're doing, you know, and you see this weird looking things with stuff like you know, and engineers chasing them with white lab coats and, 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 uh, and clipboards. Tesla, by virtue of the fact of the autonomous information that they're already gathering from the cars, they have data exceeding 1.6 billion kilometers from all the cars that have been out there driving. So they're already accumulating that and using artificial intelligence to data mine that to figure out how do we not kill the, the cyclist? How do we realize that someone with a white cane can't see? And, and, and I mean, it hurts my brain to think that, that they were so forward thinking with this business model that essentially you're paying them to do their market research to get to a point where they are going to be one of those, one of those on-demand transport uh, uh, as, as a service. And ultimately renewables, and renewables fit into this perspective because it ultimately lowers our CO2 emissions significantly. 
and they all exist. To, oh, sorry, there's the 20 versus 2,000 moving parts. And the IoT, IoT is, is the Internet of Things. Uh, uh, and as we all know, most cars, even the least expensive today, have, have uh, significant connections with the Internet. Um, and artificial intelligence is, is key there. Um, so what happens with autonom autonomous vehicles? Here's the other thing, is that, is that as much as we're trying to move, as, so I'm going to back up and say, okay, today, as much as Emerge is trying to move as many of those 8,000 people that have decided to buy a damn car in spite of the fact that the guy whose name is Ferrari who hates cars doesn't want them to, <laughs> we want them to make a decision to get an EV because it will help accelerate the technology and hopefully we can get, hopefully the unintended um, consequences won't be so severe that you're all going to be pointing at me and say, I told you so, you were wrong, Ferrari. So autonomous vehicles, from private ownership to fleet, they're all looking at that. All major car companies in the last year, 10 years have bought out major car rental companies. Not because they want to rent cars, but several things. They want to do something called vertical integration. Uh, uh, so, so that what they're doing is that they want to manufacture the cars, sell them to themselves, rent them to you and eventually make autonomous vehicles so they've got this system in place to do it. Not quite as sophisticated as Elon Musk and the Tesla gang is, but they've already been thinking along those lines. I mean, you just start working up that food chain and see where the corporate ownership uh, uh, goes from. Oops, back up just a second quickly. Um, oh, and here's a clincher. Seven times cheaper than owning a car. Some out there are suggesting 10 times cheaper than owning a car. So. Let that sit with you for a second, but look at this next page. That means $6,000 a year after tax that's in your pocket. The average house, and, and this is a conservative number, the average household per car, when you consider depreciation, gasoline, insurance, and maintenance is approaching $9,000 over the lifetime of that car. So $6,000 a year going into your pocket. Imagine what you could do with that. Um, 160,000 kilometers per year autonomous vehicles are expected to go to, to use versus the average EV, this transition car that we like to talk about, would only be able to do 20,000 because it's sitting there for, four, uh, it's, it's sitting there for 96% of the time. So the total fleet, and by what I mean is the total fleet, the total amount of cars that exist in Guelph or any place would drop 70%. So 70% by, and again, that's a conservative number. Imagine that a third of the city's, um, uh, uh, the third of downtown core areas are devoted, a minimum of a third are devoted to cars, whether it's parking or whether it's the actual roads. So imagine the implications if we had fewer, fewer vehicles. And I'm gonna back up for a second that we've been talking about personal vehicles, but now imagine that those autonomous vehicles would be scalable. Do you remember how that slide that we showed of that, you know, the, 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 the person walking and, the, and we also had electrified public transit. Imagine that you had a choice. You know, you're on a fixed income. You can't afford to be the only person in that car, but you're willing to walk 200 meters or 100 meters. So there's a scale of services. So now all of a sudden you say, well, you know what? I'm really on a tight budget. I'm willing to walk three or 400 meters. Now all of a sudden, Click it in there, it says, meet us at this corner at exactly this time. I show up there, and there are 15 or 20 other people on that vehicle. Public so it, it, it essentially gets to public transit, and some are, I haven't seen a lot of data on it, but, but, but some are suggesting this could be, heaven forbid, the death knell of public transit, or it provides an opportunity for public transit authorities to take up that portion of it. Because then all of a sudden, the, the, the economics of this make it a lot easier for them an awful lot easier for them. And 80% of parking will be obsolete. So transportation as a service, here's, here's an interesting thing that Tony Seba, if you haven't looked this guy up, make a point of looking for Tony Seba, you'll get sucked into his vortex. And they've done some remarkable work at, at, at looking at where this stuff is going. They did an analysis of, this, analysis of the city of Los Angeles, and based on the stats that he pulled from all the research, that his, that his think tank pulled from all the research up there, he suggested that you would be able to drop in three San Franciscos in the amount of, uh, into Los Angeles based on the amount of land that you were freeing up. I, I, I mean, that just hurts my brain. I, I, I mean, I can't fathom. I've, 
you know, I've only ever flown out of uh, Los Angeles, but I can imagine, I mean, it's a huge place. Oh, and by the way, uh, San Francisco, the city of San Francisco is within 30 square kilometers of the same size as the city proper of Toronto. So you start getting a sense of this, not the metropolitan area, but like, like the, well, what used to be metropolitan Toronto, the city, the city of Toronto. Um, so that transportation and service will drastically change what our cities look like, or more importantly, it provides us with a huge, importantly, um, a, um, a huge opportunity to rethink what our cities look like. So I want to live long enough to see the parking in <laughs> Guelph repurposed because we won't need them anymore. And on that note, <laughs>